just two months after one of the worst atrocities the world had ever seen, the skies over New York would once again see a city thrown into panic. 265 souls would be lost when American Airlines Flight 587 falls to the ground, destroying a sleepy neighbourhood. Is it another act of terror or something more subtle and avoidable? The 12th of November 2001, JFK International Airport, New York, the United States of America. Flight 587 is nothing unusual, a regular run to Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. On board are 251 passengers and 9 crew, totalling 260. Many of those catching the flight are families, tourists and Dominicans heading home. The two pilots complete their checklist and await their turn to depart. The weather is calm, the sky clear and all seems routine. Ahead of them is a Japan Airlines flight taking off. Like normal, they allow it time to create enough distance in order to minimise any turbulence they encounter when following it. When an aircraft moves through the air, especially something like a large airliner, as a consequence of lift generation, it creates what is known as wake turbulence, a trail of invisible swirling air that acts as a miniature horizontal tornado. The larger the aircraft, the stronger the turbulence will be. If they do not leave themselves a large enough space apart from the other jet, the turbulent air could cause sudden violent buffeting or even loss of control, especially during a takeoff or landing when they are flying slowly and are at their most vulnerable. The first officer is the pilot flying and the captain monitoring the plane's instruments and dealing with radio communication. The first officer asks the captain if he's happy with the amount of separation they'll have from the Japan Airlines flight ahead of them, to which he replies that he is. The aircraft they are flying is an Airbus A300, specifically A600 series, the latest and most advanced version of Airbus's first wide-body jet. It features digital instruments and advanced automation, eliminating the need for a flight engineer. The original A300 was the world's first ever twin-engined wide-body airliner. They push the throttle levers forward and begin their takeoff. The first officer pulls back on his control column, rotating the aircraft, and they climb out of JFK and through the skies above Jamaica Bay, New York. Just a few minutes into the flight, the aircraft encounters the wake turbulence from the Japanese flight ahead. The plane buffets as the disturbed air rocks it from side to side. The first officer reacts, turning his controls and alternating left and right with the rudder in rapid succession, as per his training which he reverts back to. He asks the captain for maximum power in order to increase their speed, making the aircraft more stable, but the captain doesn't think it necessary and doesn't do so. He asks, you alright? He seems surprised by his co-pilot's intensity, and tells him calmly and reinforcingly to just hang on to it, not believing it himself to be a threat. The aircraft's vertical stabiliser, the tall fin at the rear of the plane, experiences enormous stress forces due to the violent motion and separates completely. With the tail gone, the aircraft completely loses stability and plummets out of control, entering a flat spin. The captain shouts, get out of it, get out of it. Both engines detach from the wings due to the intense aerodynamic forces, and at 9.16am, Flight 587 slams into the Bell Harbor neighborhood in Queens, New York, destroying a number of houses and setting the whole area ablaze. All 260 people on board, along with 5 on the ground, are lost in the crash. A huge plume of smoke can be seen for miles. To many, some whom had survived the World Trade Center, are taken back mentally to those horrible events they witnessed only two months before. Could the plane have been brought down as a deliberate act? Many fear so. As a precaution, several major buildings, including the Empire State Building and the headquarters of the United Nations, are evacuated, and some bridges and tunnels closed. As it is not known if the loss of American Airlines 587 is a genuine accident or a criminal act, both the NTSB and FBI arrive to begin the investigation. Soon after the crash, the aircraft's tail is found floating in Jamaica Bay, giving investigators a huge clue as to what went wrong on Flight 587. 
it is raced from the water and upon inspection, the tail looks to have been torn from the rest of the aircraft by an overwhelming force. When they listen to the cockpit voice recorder, they hear no alarms, no panic leading up to the loss of control, just the calm, professional voices of the crew as they enter the turbulence of the flight in front of them. The turbulence which shouldn't be strong enough to pose a threat. But it is when they cross-reference the cockpit recording with the flight data recorder, the one that logs flight parameters and control inputs, which reveals the critical truth. The rudder, the vertical control surface located on the tail for your control, normally used at lower speeds close to the ground, had been moved aggressively in rapid succession fully from side to side just before the in-flight breakup. While conducting their interviews as part of the investigation, the NTSB discover that the first officer had used this same technique in a previous incident of turbulence, which had shocked the captain who he'd flown with, which he and most others would consider a complete overreaction. When asked why he did this, the first officer replied with he'd been taught to do that in his training with American Airlines. It is discovered that a controversial technique to recover from in-flight upsets was being taught to some pilots by the airline, in which, in a flight simulator, the plane's bank angle would reach a staggering 90 degrees, literally on its side, before they were told to recover. Such a position is well beyond that what would reasonably be encountered in the real world. To recover from such a steep bank angle would require the rudder, but when applied to the aircraft while in a mere 5 to 10 degrees of bank, which it would realistically encounter during turbulence, is totally unnecessary and will put undue stress on the airframe. But could the tail of an aircraft really break off due to control inputs made by the pilot? To see if it can, they examine the material the tail is constructed from and how it is held onto the fuselage. The tail section of the Airbus A300 is constructed not only from metal, but also from composite carbon fibre materials. It is connected to the fuselage using a total of six attachment points, which are made up of a series of lugs, half of them aluminium and half composite, of which the composite lugs had failed. They worry that if there was a defect in the manufacturing process of this advanced material, thousands more aircraft across the world could be in danger. But after careful inspection, and with the help and expertise of Airbus Industries, it is found that the composite material was up to the job. Confident the material didn't fail due to a defect, but rather due to excessive aerodynamic forces, they decide to run a calculation to work out exactly how much pressure would be put on the tail fin at the speed it was travelling, over 250 miles per hour, and being pushed all the way from one direction to the other repeatedly. What they find shocks them. Amazingly, they conclude that the forces on the tail, if making the same inputs the first officer had done, would have exerted over twice the maximum it was designed to withstand. By manipulating the controls in the wrong way, it was entirely possible to rip the tail clean off of the aircraft. The NTSB concludes that the crash was caused by the first officer's rudder movements, which were excessive and unnecessary in the wake of the turbulence. Further stating, if the first officer had stopped making additional inputs, the aircraft would have stabilised. He had not realised that the majority of the violent swaying motion the flight was experiencing wasn't actually caused by the turbulence, but a result of his own control inputs. However, he did not act without influence. His actions were shaped by training materials that suggested that heavy rudder use was an appropriate response to turbulence. In fact, American Airlines' simulator programs had reinforced that approach. Airbus itself had even advised airlines about the stress doing so would put on the airframe. But pilots were still unaware that excessive or rapid use of the rudder at those speeds could push the aircraft beyond its structural limits. The system was not broken, but it had a dangerous potential. In the wrong hands, under the wrong conditions, it could be catastrophic. Finally, the design of the A300-600 itself played a role. Its rudder pedals required only light pressure and minimal movement, making it far easier to apply dangerously large control movements potentially without realising. 
Airbus issues updated guidelines and technical information about rudder sensitivity and safe flight procedures, and all airlines and pilots who operate the A300 are immediately made aware of the danger of overuse of the rudder while at high speeds and altitudes, and training adjusted accordingly. American Airlines changes its training curriculum, eliminating the flawed simulator scenarios that had encouraged such aggressive inputs. Still unsatisfied, some American Airlines A300 pilots request to be transferred to Boeing aircraft, saying they no longer hold confidence in the Airbus. The loss of Flight 587 was not due to sabotage, but a tragic convergence of misunderstanding, human error, incorrect training, and a design vulnerability. Its legacy serves as a reminder that safety lies not just in reliable machinery, but in the harmony between technology, training, and human judgment. If you enjoyed this YouTube documentary, give it a like for the time and effort it took me to make, and subscribe so you can catch new episodes as soon as I upload them. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again next time.